piece like this is very simple. That's a sort of orangey colour where I've simply removed um, all of the orange from there to make that white. But in a pair like that, each of the colours has been partially removed in different areas so that both colours are there where that sort of blue green is. Only the green is left here and only the violet's left here. And all these sort of half tones and mixtures of the two colours. One paints beeswax on the surface and then dips it into acid and um, after um, say half an hour you can lift the piece out and see how far it's gone. You know like with this blue area that's the original tone and after a certain amount of time the acid would have taken the blue out to mm. this tone. And so when this was erected here against daylight, it looked a little bit like that. So the colour was sorted out, but the imagery is now being developed with paint. So it's a sort of strangely um, subdivided process where first colour is dealt with and then drawing is added. Or rather the drawing is refining what the colour is doing. Um, in an area like this, mm. a lot is already done with the acid etching and these rather interesting you, you discover what interesting mixtures and how false the idea of um, uh, primary colours is by using um, glass you know green and uh, green and violet makes blue and then um, cool green and um, pink makes violet and so on so um, it's interesting the sort of mixtures one gets from but then yes the the paint is then um, refining what's mm. what the acid is. Um, and the, the reason for these little pairs mm. here and there is structural. Just running up through there, we'll, we'll have a copper tie there, which will tie the window to mm. a bar going across here. And you can't really put a copper tie there because the pressure will crack. So that, you know, that's a structural thing that... Um, yeah. So the leads are necessary for structural reasons? Yes. Um, I mean, you, there are lots of ways of doing glass, of working with glass now that are completely new and don't involve leads and um, long-winded processes, but I think um, the slight awkwardness of the, of the procedure, I think, um, actually has all sorts of interesting possibilities. Um, it's not that one's working in the dark, but it, it's quite difficult to keep the whole thing in your head yeah. when um, when it's individual pieces that are in mm -hmm. trays, and you know you need to sort of retain the relationships between the adjoining pieces. And um, sometimes, when I erect it here, they need changing. Where are these going to go eventually? Um, they're going to go in a chapel in Gloucester Cathedral. And um, they're going to be in a row, and above them is a row to do with Ivor Gurney that I did a couple of years ago. Tom, could you just take us from left to right and explain yes. the, the, the origins of the... Yes. Well, um, I think that one of the things that is interesting to me is the relationship between music and visual art and how one can make, um, how can one make something that is very different but still have, speaks in some way about um, the medium. But with, with Gerald Finzi, he himself of course was very interested in um, making work about people. Um, so I found that that was an interesting way in to take imagery um, that he himself used for music, um, so that there's this sort of third layer of um, exploration of themes. And um, so each of the sections has a particular um, subject, but at the same time, I think the, in many ways, a lot of his music has this tenderness that is summed up in the phrase intimations of immortality. Although that's a huge and uh, spectacular thing, it still has these very intimate I think a lot of the themes that he picked up on in Traherne and Hardy and Shakespeare 
again, are intimations of immortality. Um, so in, this is about Traherne. Um, I know that the passage um, from um, Traherne that speaks of a child is about a newborn child, but I feel that so much of Traherne is about the seeingness of a, the wonderful freshness of a child's vision. So the child I've placed is a little bit older, but wide-eyed with wonder at his surroundings. Yes. It's intended to evoke Chosen Hill. Mm. Um, and I think it's probably true to say, would you not, that very particular landscapes are important to Gerald Finzi. Mm. This is um, this yew tree is about um, Finzi's lifelong involvement with the works of Thomas Hardy. Um, and as you know, he made these hardy pilgrimages through it was an occasion when he must have passed down our hill and must have passed a particular yew tree. And then the hardy song setting of um, voices of things in a churchyard. Um, one of those voices is a yew tree and another is the daisies growing at its feet. So I love the sort of layers that one can explore there where my own interest and in such things and my own surroundings, um, uh, as it were, reiterating things already explored first by Hardy and then and then these others veil going away with the proud songsters, mm -hmm. thrushes singing. The, um, the space in here, sort of made of dead leaves, which leads in, and then these veils that are running across the distance um, is intended to evoke the idea of passing through into illness and death, and, and, then, you, and, and then used again and again in song settings. So this is thinking about the um, the Shakespeare setting of Fear No More, The Heat of the Sun, and this figure sort of trying to find his way through and um, the sunlight beyond. So this is, well, uh, this and this perhaps are both about this idea of um, making connections between the past and the present and um, the, um, the way one can move beyond um, what is history and what is now um, in, in a work of art or in a place um, what one's interested in and um, this is to do with the idea of someone hearing or discovering a work of art deep in the future um, and the poem and the setting to a poet a thousand years hence so the sleeping poet and the thing he's made is sort of the threads of its roots and the flowering is then connected to someone who hears into this distance. Orchard is about um, connecting with the past um, and I think it was you Liz who first brought to my attention the idea of shaking the hands of a good friend across the centuries. I love that idea, and, um, and the idea of um, feeling that friendship, but also valuing things of different kinds, and um, recognising the qualities of things that others hadn't noticed, like in Finzi's case, the work of Mr. Boyce and Mr. Stanley, who are approaching them through the orchard. I think. Um, anyone who's lived in the 20th century has to absorb horrors as well as beauties and I think that's um, one of the strong things about Gerald Finzi's music that it's not all lovely. And this image is to do with the um, that terrible um, harsh 
rejection of St. Cecilia. He's, um, and the imagery is to do with that, and then the character, the jagged character, that is intended to reflect that as well. I mean, actually, that, that in a way sums up the theme of seeing sound, um, looking but, and hearing bells in that lovely um, in Parapax, and then those sounds becoming fixed in the last stone in the stars. And then this, you know, it seems a bit. Um, a gesture full of effrontery, just try and make a tiny image that has anything of the grandeur of um, intimations of immortality. Um, but I suppose one can point to largeness in the landscape and miniatureness in the landscape as um, a kind of equivalent to the musical piece and to the imagery of um, Wordsworth, and then this is the, the, that important hill in the Gloucestershire landscape, known and loved to everyone who became involved with Gloucestershire in the 20th century, well, and now, of course, but, um, not only Gerald Finzi, but Ivor Gurney, too. So all, all of these are, are fairly well developed, but I think um, I'll probably do two more days' work on each panel to change or develop things. That are in about 10 days, I will be able to send off panels um, for Patrick to start letting while I'm finishing off other panels.